song you just heard was the same song. It's just sung in two different languages. And that song is known by a lot of different names. But its lyrics, if you had your Bibles open, the lyrics, I think they were out of the New King James Version, come directly out of Scripture. They come out of Luke chapter 1 specifically. And some of the names that song is known for, is, it's, it's called Mary's Song by some people. The Song of Mary by other people. It's called the Canticle of Mary. The Canticle is a poem or a hymn, specifically a, a psalm or a, a hymn or, or a song that is a praise. And the most common name is, and what you may know it by, is the Magnificat. The Magnificat is Mary's song. It's the song that she sings in response to something that happened in her life that was so wonderful, so amazing. Now, I'm sure you noticed that there was two different languages there. I mean, you're all smart people. It's hard to miss. The first and last were actually Latin. There's a reason I did that, and we'll talk about that just in, in a minute. But it's the same song in the middle there. You could hear the English words as well. But again, they come directly out of Scripture. If you had your Bibles open, you could read word for word what it was saying. But as Rob was saying this morning, it's so hard for me to believe that we are about headed into the Christmas season. I mean, it just seems like this year has flown by so fast. Now, we're getting ready to head into a season that a lot of denominational churches, not as many as used to, celebrate called the Season of Advent. And most non-denominational churches don't celebrate the Season of Advent. I choose to do so because I think it's important. The reason that the church set these traditions up over the years was so that they would help us to remember what we're celebrating and why we're celebrating it. Advent in particular, Advent in particular, is a beautiful time of year. It's one of the most important times of year. It is a time of year that we remember the arrival of Christ. Advent comes from the Latin word adventus. It means arrival. And we're celebrating the first arrival of Jesus Christ into the world. Now, as Christians... This is, this is a time that we celebrate, and we're going to be talking about the joy and the hope and the love and, and the peace that we can have that's found only in Christ Jesus. But it speaks of a time when we are in the already, but not the quite yet. And that sort of sounds confusing, but we're in this time where Jesus has come for the first time, and, and you just have to imagine, this is a, a God that's all-powerful, all-knowing. That's what they call omnipresent, everywhere at the same time. He's not limited by anything. And yet, he loves us so much that he wraps himself in human flesh, in all the confinements of human flesh, and comes to dwell among his people. And he comes so that we can know him, and we can know him as not just God the Son, but he tells us that we can know, if we know him, we'll know God the Father. And this season of Advent is so important that it has actually changed the entire world. Before the Advent, before the arrival of Christ, we call time B.C. or before Christ. But after the Advent, we say it's A.D., which is Latin again for Ado Domini, which means in the year of the Lord. And make no mistake about it. When they say in the year of the Lord, they are talking about Jesus Christ. The only person ever born, ever arrived, that changed the way we measure all of history. The whole world was changed at this first advent, this first arrival of Jesus Christ. So we're heading in a time where we celebrate Christmas. We celebrate the birth of Jesus. But like I said earlier, we're in the already but not quite yet. For those of us who believe, we look forward to the second advent of Christ. His second arrival. And his second arrival, he's coming not as Savior, he's coming as Judge. And I want to meet Jesus as a Savior. I never want to meet him as a Judge because I know my heart. I know my thoughts. I know the things that are hidden inside the dark places. 
Now, with all this in mind, there's a couple things that, uh, that brings to my attention. First of all, next Sunday is the first Sunday in Advent. First Sunday in Advent is always four weeks before the Sunday of Christmas, or the Sunday after Christmas. And since, since Sunday is Christmas this year, we're not going to have church on Sunday morning this year. We're going to have it Saturday night. We're expecting a, a really large event for that. Christmas Eve, believe it or not, Christmas Eve services are the second largest attended services in the entire Christian year, Easter being number one. So I'm looking forward to our Christmas Eve service, and it's going to be special. We're going to have all kinds of, uh, it's going to be a little different. There'll be more singing and less preaching, so for some of you, you'll, you'll really like that. But there'll still be a lot of preaching, so don't, you know, for those of you who like the preaching, you're going to get that too. But it also means there's only five weeks from the day until Christmas. So, for those of you that haven't started Christmas shopping like me, uh, we're in the already, but it's already here type of frame of mind. But we're really starting just a little bit early, and this series that we're doing, this Hymns of Luke, isn't really a Christmas series. It's talking about the hymns that are found in the book of Luke, specifically the five hymns that are found in the first, five cha or first two chapters of Luke. But it does speak about the uh, pregnancy of Mary. The uh, speaks about the uh, what happened after Jesus was born. It happens what's happened during his conception and during her present present pregnancy. So it, it it is in a way a Christmas series, but it's not really a Christmas series. Uh, some theologians believe that uh, Luke, the investigative doctor, was the first hymnologist of the of the New Testament, and not just being a person who writes hymns or records hymns and studies hymns. All throughout the book of Luke, there are different hymns, but there are five hymns specifically in the first two chapters. Two of them are from angels. One of them is from Mary, the mother of Jesus. It's what we call the Magnificat, or Mary song. That's the one we're going to be discussing today. The next one is one by Simeon. And then there's one that we'll discuss next week called the Benedictus, or from Zechariah. Now, according to Illustrated Bible Life, and while I'm on that subject, you don't want to miss next week. I think not just is the message going to be good, but the message is going to be shorter than usual. So that's a win for everybody who knows how I speak. <laughs> Then, after that, we're going to have food, which is another win after that. And then, and, and my wife is cooking a turkey, so we're going to have plenty of meat. Um, sorry about your luck, Rob. Um, somebody else might bring the ham, but it ain't going to be me. Uh, uh, I'll make you. But then we have the football frenzy after that. So we have the first season of Advent, or the first Sunday of Advent. And uh, we'll have a special reading in that. We have a shorter message, uh, so, so that's a win. We're going to have food, that's a win. They're going to have football frenzy, that's a win. So there is something for everybody. So invite everybody you know and everybody you see. And, and you don't have to ask them to bring anything. Just tell them to come to church and eat. And we'll feed them spiritually and we'll feed them physically. But in, in any event, there was a, an early church leader in the 4th century by the name of Basil the Great. One of the reasons that these hymns, are, they mean so much to me, is that basically the great ideas were still used in churches today. He, he Basil the Great, uh, some of these ideas, they, not only do they still in place in the churches today, but, but they're still echo in the Christian community. And, and one of the things that Basil the Great said, and one of the things that he remembered for is one time he preached on Psalm number one. So in preaching the Psalms, he says this. He says that when we're singing the Psalms, when we're singing, when we're singing the doctrines or the teachings of the Bible are somehow more deeply impressed into our minds. See, Basil the Great, he saw that poetry and that the power of a melody to carry the truth of Scripture into the very core of a person. He said, here it in a common storehouse, the combination of biblical doctrine with artistic expressions provides the full declaration of God. 
And I think to put this in, into my own words, what he was saying was putting putting these these scriptures into song, if we sing them, not only are we praising God, but we are lifted up ourselves. We begin to, to feel God's power. We begin to feel God's spirit into our very souls. And not only that, we begin to remember. It's easier to remember something that's in song form than just trying to memorize scripture. They're buried into our hearts so that we begin to be changed from the inside out. Now, as I said, there's five songs in the very first chapters of Luke, the very first two chapters, but Actually, Luke writes several hymns or records several hymns all throughout his scriptures, but we're only going to be talking about the first five. The first five that are found in the book of uh, Luke, chapters 1 and 2. And one of them, uh, the last one that we'll speak about, is really uh, uh, he takes a couple verses from scripture and uh, it's really known more in the Catholic circles than it is in the Protestant churches, but we're still going to go ahead and talk about it. It's like Mary's song, or the Magnificent. If you grew up Catholic, or if you grew up in the Episcopalian church, you would have heard this song sung in Latin on many different occasions. But today, that's what we're starting with. We're starting with the Magnificent. We're starting with Mary's song, and it's found in the very first chapter of Luke, and we're going to start reading in verse 26, and we're going to read all the way through verse 56. Now, remember earlier, and I said I explained why uh, I had that song in Latin, why we started and ended in Latin. Well, the word Magnificent is the first word in the lyrics when it's sung in Latin. Magnificent means to magnify. It's the opening of this Mary song, this Magnificent in the Latin version of the Bible. And, and what a lot of people don't realize is the Latin version of the Bible was really uh, the only Bible available for, for anybody to read for a little bit over a thousand years unless you spoke, spoke Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic. Somewhere around 350 AD, someone translated, the Catholic Church had someone translate the Greek, the Aramaic, and the Hebrew, the original languages that the scriptures were written into, into Latin. And they firmly believed that's the language and the only language that it should ever be spoken. Now there was a lot of reasons behind it. Some of them were good, some of them were bad. But for over a thousand years, that was the only available version other than the original language. It was just in Latin. And then somewhere around 1360 AD, somebody translated the entire Bible into French. <coughs> but French wasn't a language that was spoken in very many places around the world. So we still for all intent and purposes, only had the Latin version of the Bible. And since most people didn't speak Latin, they had to rely on the interpretation of what the priest said. So he would read it in Latin, and then he would explain it. But nobody really knew if what he was saying was accurate or not because they didn't speak Latin. Then sometime around 1522, a man by the name of Martin Luther. And Martin Luther was a great reformer. He, he was the catalyst of what we call the Re Reformation period in Scripture. He began to translate the Bible into German. And again, German's not a language that's very easily spoken. But it was the first time the Bible was available to the masses. The public, the uh, printing press had just come out, so it could be printed. But it wasn't until around 1526 that a man by the name of William Tyndall began to translate the Bible into English. And he translated the Bible into the New Testament into English, but he never was able to finish the Old Testament. There's a reason for that. The church was so adamant about keeping the Bible in Latin that they declared that William Tyndall was a heretic. They put him on trial. And before he could finish the Old Testament, 
They actually found him guilty and executed him for translating the Bible. His only crime was translating the Bible from Latin into English. And a lot of us, if you look at the back of your Bible, it, it was read by Tyndale Publishing. They were named after this William Tyndale. Now, in 1611, or sometime before 1611, King James of England decided that he would like to have a version of Scripture that the common person would read. So in 1611, he had the monks come out and they produced a Bible in what we call the King James Version that was available in 1611. Now that was just about almost 1,400 years after it was translated from the original language into, language, into any other language in the original. It was in Latin. So, so really, we went 1,400 years without the common person being able to read the Bible. And there are some churches today that still use the King James Version, and they claim that that's the only version they should read from. Now, I've had the privilege of being able to read the letter that the monks wrote back to King James, and they were talking about how honored they were that they were able to translate this scripture so that the common man could understand. And so that you understand, if, of course, because I know there's still people that, that, that they call the King James the authorized version. They believe that's the only version available. But my belief is that we don't speak Old English any longer. The words have become archaic. And some of the words that were spoken in 1611 don't even mean the same thing today. And it was a translation for the common man. So primarily I speak out of the New Living Translation because in my research I found that it's a very accurate translation and it's spoken in a language and it's, it's written in a language that I understand. It's a simple translation. Most of you know I'm a simple man in more than one way. So I speak out of the New Living Translation. Now we're going to start reading again at chapter 1 of the Gospel of Luke. Luke is the third chapter of your New Testament. And if you don't have your Bibles with you, they'll be up, the words will be up here on the screen, so you don't have to worry about that. But if you like the New Living Translation, or you don't have a Bible, or you know somebody that does, there's plenty of Bibles up here. You take one, you give it away, you keep it, you write in it, you do whatever you want. And if all of those are gone, i got another stack in the back. We're not going to let it run out, of, run out of Bibles. And if you just want a New Testament, you don't want the whole Bible, I have those as well. So anyway, Merry Christmas, hello world. Now I'm going to try to break this lesson down, and you know, there's some lessons that are more inspirational and others that are more informational. Uh, I'm going to try to break it down in two parts. This is, this is a teaching lesson, and information is important. So the first part of it is going to be informational, but informational is not transformational, is it? Application is transformational. So we're going to give you the information up front, that's my hope, and then I'm going to try to give you how we apply this to our lives so that we can have transformation in, my, in our lives. Now here's a promise I can make you. Whether you believe in Jesus Christ or not, if you apply the things that are written in God's words to your life, your life will be better. Amen. At least in this life. I can't tell you what's going to happen in the next life. But the Apostle Paul puts it this way in his letter to the Christians. He puts it this way. He says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world. Now, for those of you who know me, for years I copied the things of this world. And it led to nothing but heartache and trouble. But Paul goes on to say, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Some people translate repent. But repentance just simply means change the way you think. And he says, then, then you will learn, because it doesn't come natural, you have to learn it, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And who doesn't want to live a good, pleasing life and a perfect life? So, let me read the verses, and I'm going to read them through for the most part. I'm going to begin in verse 26 through chapter 1 the Gospel of Luke, and then we'll come back and discuss them. So starting in verse 26, it starts out like this. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. 
In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth. <laughs> Oh, I, that did sound very familiar to me, didn't it? <laughs> Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Now, can you imagine? It says, confused and disturbed. Well, I guess she was. All of a sudden, an angel appears. And we don't know what angel looks like. But the first thing every angel ever says is, Do not be afraid. So they must be sort of scared. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Do not be afraid, Mary. Good, because I was just afraid. The angels told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. Now, we're going to speak more about this in, in one of the other series, but, but Elizabeth was beyond childbearing age. In other words, she had already gone through menopause. It was impossible in man's way for her to become pregnant. But here she is. Mary gets this news. People used to call her barren. But now she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month for the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believe that the Lord will do what he said. Now, I started with verse 26 for a reason. I explained that. This is where we get into the magnificent. Mary responded, Oh, how my soul praises. Some translation magnifies. Oh, how my soul magnifies the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Eta Maria, magnificat, onumi, mia, do minu, et. Exulta beat spiritus meos in Deo salatori meo. And if you're a Latin specialist, forgive me, my language is <laughs> sura. But in Latin, this means magnify, magnify the Lord. Oh, how my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. My soul to magnify the Lord. And my spirit hath rejoiced in the Lord, my Savior. It's just beautiful. Now, the reason I started in verse 26 is to show you who Mary is actually responding to. Because if we just start with the Magnificat and you hear the backstory, you think that Mary's responding to what Gabriel had told her. And when you think that, you sort of miss something. What Mary's responding to is what Elizabeth has just said. Because Gabriel had told her these wonderful and these amazing things. 
And as we read this, we can see the joy that Mary has. But she's not responding to David. She's responding to Elizabeth. Experts tell you that if you're going to study a section of Scripture and if you want to know it, they have a 20-20 rule. You read the 20 before and the 20 after. The 20 before and the 20 after gives you context. So if we were only to read the Magnificent, we would be going, well, this is what Mary is saying in response to Gabriel. But when you read the 20 before and the 20 after, you see that Mary is responding to Elizabeth. And if you don't see that, you miss something. So, he goes on. Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and the haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel to be remembered, to be merciful. For he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then went back to her own home. It's a reading of God's Word, and I pray that it will make itself real in our hearts and our minds. The great preacher from the 19th century, a man by the name of Charles Spurgeon, he writes this, he makes this comment about these verses. He said, wouldn't it be wonderful if all our social visits were as useful to our hearts as this visit was to Mary. Uh -huh. You know, Mary, who was pregnant with Jesus, goes to see Elizabeth, who's pregnant with John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist wasn't called John the Baptist because he was Baptist. And I, I remember speaking to a lady one time, and she goes, I'm Baptist because that's what John was when he announced Christ. Uh -huh. Jesus wasn't even born yet. There were no Christianity wasn't in here, let alone denomination. He was called John the Baptist because he baptized people. So more accurately, he should be called John the Baptizer. But Mary goes to see, and, and, and the word that uh, used in the Greek is sort of funny. We know she was a family member. Uh, most people believe it, it was her cousin. Uh, but the word is a little unsure. It could be the sister. It could be. It could be many different things. But but most people believe that it should be translated cousin. But either way, she was a family Mary. Goes to see her cousin Mary, and before long, as they're sitting there together, I mean, she walks in the door, and her baby inside her leaves her joint. All of a sudden, they're praising God. And I'm thinking, wouldn't it be great? If we would do that in our social visit, wouldn't it be great if we just did that in the church? Some churches, and not this church, but some churches, if Mary and Elizabeth walk in here together, they would condemn Mary for being an unwed mother, and they would condemn Elizabeth for being too old to have another child, mm -hmm. or to have her first child. I just pray sometimes that our fellowship here at the Odyssey Church at our Thanksgiving dinners coming up, so often I hear these stories about, you know, my family gets together and it's always a fight. You know, my prayer is that here at the Odyssey Church, at our Thanksgiving dinners that are coming up, at the Christmas season, at work, at the grocery store, may all our social visits be as pleasurable as what Mary and Elizabeth were. May they be profitable to the kingdom of God. May they glorify and magnify our Lord, our Savior. But you know, in order to do that, we have to be intentional and purposeful about it. We have to watch our tongues and we have to think about what we're going to say because even if that's our intention, it's not always the intention of the people that we hang around with, is it? Uh -huh. And you think about this. You know, I, and I do. Uh, I, I'm human and, and, and I see something else going on in somebody else's life that's not going on mine. Elizabeth could have been the same way. Elizabeth could have been jealous. Savior into the world, and we're going to find out that, that Zechariah was a just man. He was a devout man. 
He was a man who was a high priest. He was more religious. And Mary's only about 14 years old, and this young girl walks in, and, and God has chosen her over Mary. She could have been jealous, but she wasn't. Instead of being jealous, she rejoices with Mary for what God has done. So, not part of the message, but sort of a side note, one way to overcome jealousy is to celebrate with somebody who's had a victory. Celebrate what God is doing in their life. It's hard to be jealous of somebody when you're celebrating with them. Mary. Mary could have been prideful. You know? She could have had false humility. Well, you know. She could have denied her position as the mother of Jesus. But if she had done any of those things, First of all, she'd be refused, she would be guilty of refusing God's gift, or she would be guilty of taking credit for what God Himself had done, and only God Himself could do. True humility, true humility, is accepting the gifts that God has given you, and then using them to serve Him and to glorify Him. We can't deny what God has given us. We have to look at our life and say, what is this gift that God has? And then we don't deny them. We thank God for them. And then we use them for His glory. But so often our songs, and I, I speak for myself, I, I don't know you, but I know a lot of people. Our songs and our prayers, and they, they sort of reflect our hearts. A lot of times they're self-centered. A lot of times they're, Lord, what can you do for me? Instead of, Lord, what can I do for you? Not Mary. Not Mary. Mary, she acknowledges God's sovereignty. She acknowledges God's providence upon the upon her life and the mighty act, the mighty act that he's doing in her life. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Tara, can you turn next slide, please? There you go. I'm sorry. See, when she says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, what she's saying is, my soul is everything about me. It's everything. It's my body. It's my whole life. It's all my strength. It's my mind. I hold God in high esteem. I hide Him. I hold Him. He, he's dear to me. I honor Him as much and as reverently and as highly as I can. Mary was praising God for the miracle He had produced in her life. I mean, we shouldn't deny, we shouldn't deny the gifts God has given us any more than we should brag about. We should use the gifts that God has given us as Mary to praise God for the gifts He has given us, to rejoice in the gifts that God has given us, to magnify God by using the gifts He has given us. Mary, she's rejoicing in the things God has done. She's rejoicing in what He's going to do. He's, she's magnifying His holy name. And He is, if we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is both our Lord and our Savior, We should rejoice. We should praise. We should magnify. I mean, if you think about this, if God never did anything else for us but to save us from the pits of hell, it's really more than we deserve. So we should do as Mary did. We should sing out loud and we should sing often. My soul magnifies the Lord. And I rejoice in Lord my Savior. We should praise and magnify and rejoice in Him. And there's some people, there's some people who, who think in, uh, that Mary was actually boasting about what happened in her life, that she was actually bragging because she says these words. She says, he, 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 he meaning God, God took notice of His lowly servant. And from now on, all generations, forever and ever, they will call me blessed, for the mighty one is holy, and He has done great things for me. And then, and, and if you're a Catholic or grew up Catholic, please forgive me for this. But there's people out there, there's 
denominations there that, that believe that Mary should be worshipped. And I, and I believe as I see the humility in Mary, she, she knew how she was worshipped today. She would, she would be so embarrassed. She would be so upset. Some people believe that she was sinless. Mary was not sinless. She knew she wasn't sinless. That's why she said, I rejoice in my Lord, my Savior. She knew she couldn't save herself. She knew she needed somebody to do it for her. If she could do it on her end, then if she could do it on her own, there'd be no need for Christ. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. Mary wasn't boasting. Mary was praising the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 27, verse 21, in the New International Version, it reads like that. For the crucible for silver, and the furnace for gold. Now, if the crucible is for silver and the furnace is for gold, we would think, we would think that this verse would go on to say, well, that trials, tribulations, and pain is what is tested by man. We're tested by our hardships. We're tested by our trials. We're tested by the, the things that come in our life. But that's not what it says. It says the crucible for silver and the furnace for gold. But man is tested by the praise he receives. Now, isn't that interesting? See, if God was going to use me to save the world and I speak as a fool, I'd want to tell everybody about what God had done for me and what he was going to do to me and how great it was going to be. Man's a strange animal. You pat him on the back and his head swells up. <laughs> but not Mary. Mary's not like me. She is so full of praise. You know, if we didn't have the rest of the Bible, if we didn't know Scripture, we would never know that God used Mary. By this song, we would never know that God used Mary to do the things He was about to do. Mary saw the most astounding thing that God was doing. But she doesn't mentioned that he's going to use her to bring Christ into the world. He sees the most outstanding thing that God was ever going to do, and, and it wasn't that God was going to send the Messiah. That's not what astounded Mary. What astounded Mary, they expected this. This had been prophesied. They knew it was coming. They just didn't know when. Mary wasn't astounded at the fact that God was going to send the Messiah. She was astounded at the fact that he was going to use her as the tool to bring the Messiah. And then in right in the middle of her praise, she begins to say, he shows his mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and the haughty ones. He has brought down princes from the thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. Right in the middle of the song, he's, she's like, God's mercy is from generation to generation. And I'm honored. And I'm privileged. But it isn't for anything that I've done. It's all because of what God has done. And then Mary begins to give these paradoxes. She begins to give these mysteries of God. These things that look opposite to the world's view, but in God's eye are just. See, God's always done it this way. You read through the scripture, and he brings down those that are high. Those that are full of pride, and he raises up the low and those that are humble. He brings down the proud and the exalted, and he exalts and rises up those who or not. He feeds the hungry. He sent the rich man away empty. More than half of Mary's song, more than half of the Magnificent, is about the wonderful mercies of God and how he can use somebody like her. And then Mary reminds us not only has this always been God's way, it's been his promise since the very beginning of time. For he made this promise to our a to our ancestors to Abraham and his children forever. God always keeps his promises. Amen. And scripture tells us in the book of Genesis,
God made this promise to Abraham. He said, I swear by myself, because he couldn't swear to anybody else. I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this thing, and you have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. The promises have been fulfilled. We know, we have proof, we have history that says God has done exactly that. We can't count the number of descendants of Abraham. We can't count the stars. We can't count the sand. It has been fulfilled. God always keeps his promises. And now Mary knows God is about to keep another one of his promises. He's about to deliver the Messiah, the Christ, into the world. Now, as I said, at the beginning of this message, there were two parts. There was information, and then there was application. So we have the information. We've looked at what Mary has said. But we have to figure out, how does Mary's song, how does the Magnificat apply to our lives? How does it help us in our day-to-day -day living? So if you look at the facts, you know, here's what we see. We see that Mary is singing because Christ is coming and Christ has been conceived in her. The subject is her Savior. Christ is coming. Christ himself is about to be born into the world. God was coming to dwell among his people. God was about to visit us. Being born just as we were born. Living as a man, as in mankind, just as we have to live as mankind. Jesus come as Emmanuel. Emmanuel translates into God with us. God was coming to be with us and to live among us. To live among his creation and among his people. And Mary wasn't just delighted that Christ was coming. Mary was delighted that Christ had been formed in her. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior before he, he took notice of his lowly servant. Here is the good news of the Magnificat. Here is the good news of Mary's song. Everybody in here gets to enjoy the very same thing. Amen. If Christ isn't conceived in us, then that Christ will have no meaning to you. If Christ is not being formed into you, the cross has no meaning whatsoever to you. We get to enjoy the very same thing. <coughs> Scripture says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. We should sing as Mary sang. Not because we're celebrating at this time of year Christ's birth or His first advent. We should sing as Mary sang because He's been conceived in our very own hearts. We get to enjoy the same favor that Mary enjoyed. We can sing as Mary sang. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced with the Lord my Savior. For he took notice of this lonely servant. The cross at Calvary may take away our sin, but Christ must be conceived in us, and then he must be formed in us, or the coming Savior will mean nothing to us. It will have no benefit whatsoever. Christ in us, conceived in us, He's been formed into Mary and she's singing, My soul magnifies the Lord. Think about this. It is personal. It's not the Lord is coming to save the world. It is my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in my Savior. See, when we sing, it's not Christ is coming to save the world. It's Christ coming to save me. He's coming to save me personally. Not Christ for all, but Christ for me. It's personal. Has Christ been conceived in your heart? If He's been conceived in your heart, has He began to grow? 
You can't know the joy of Mary. You can't praise like Mary. You can't sing like Mary unless Christ has been conceived in your heart and has begun to be formed in you and has started to grow. When Christ is formed in you, He will change your very nature. When Christ is formed in you, there will be a joy that's unspeakable that will grab you and you'll be able to sing as Mary sang. Hallelujah. Christ enters into us the same way He entered into Mary. By the power of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus enters into you by the power of the Holy Spirit, as Christ entered into Mary, it is a time of rejoicing. It is a time of praising. It is a time for singing. Yes. He, think about this too. Think about this too. Mary's song was a song of faith. Christ had not been born yet. That's right. It was early. The Holy Spirit was going to come upon Mary. It doesn't say he had come upon her. She believed what God had said. It was a simple song of faith. Christ hadn't entered the world through her yet, but by faith, Mary accepted the promise. By faith, Mary sang a song of faith or praise. Mary only had the promise that it's going to take place, but she sings as if it's already taken place. Can you sing like Mary? Can you sing by faith? Can you sing about what God has promised to do for you, yet hasn't done yet? By faith, Mary accepted Christ was within her. And by faith, we must accept that Christ is within us. Have you, by faith, accepted Christ this morning? Elizabeth said, you are blessed because you believe that the Lord would do what He said. It's the same way with us. Blessed are those who believe. Mary knew by the revelation of God, Christ had been conceived in her. It's the same way with us. When we believe, there will be a fulfillment of those things which have been told to us by the Lord. The fact Mary knew how undeserving she was did not make her stop singing, did it? It takes nothing away from the song that Mary knew that she didn't deserve the mighty things God was doing for her. It doesn't take away from the song. In fact, it adds to the song. Can we sing like Mary? Can you sing knowing that you don't deserve, that I don't deserve, to have Christ conceived in my heart, to have Him formed inside of me, to have Him start growing inside of me, only when we see our natural state, how undeserving we are. Only then, only then, do these words become so much sweeter as Christ begins to dwell in our hearts. I can't speak for you, but as I've seen what Christ has done in my life, I've been humbled by it. I mean, I know the dark places of my heart. I know that I was dead in my sin. Yet Christ chose me to be used by Him. Isaiah 40.10 says, Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and His arm shall rule for Him. Mary sings in verse 51, His mighty arm has done tremendous things. God does this so His plan and His purpose can be fulfilled. We remember we have a Savior, and that Savior is ours personally. We ought to sing as Mary sings. But if you add to that, what we already know in our hearts that we're sinful, we're unclean, times we're even hateful, we know we're undeserving. The Bible even tells us, these ancient scriptures even claim, we're, we're enemies of God. And in our own hearts, we know at least times, at least at times, this is true. Once you realize that, and you see that Christ has been conceived in you in that, Christ is being formed in you and that He's beginning to grow inside of you. Shouldn't we sing that much louder? Verse 48 says, for, verse 49 says, For the mighty one is holy and He has done great things for me. Mary sees what God has done for her and she looks into her past and looks into the past of the history of Israel to what God has always done from generation to generation. And she knows that God's about to fulfill all the promises He's made through Jesus Christ, through Emmanuel, through God with us, who's conceived in her. See, Mary's an example of worship.